Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for the second webinar of CISM Prep, a short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University. My name is Guy Coward, and I'll be your MC, and your mentor is Jeremy Costa, as usual. Wherever and whenever you're listening to this, we hope you're well and that we can provide a, a space away from all of the coronavirus, COVID-19 conjecture and, and terrible news. Please stay safe and, and, and just continue being the lovely short course crew I'm so grateful to be a part of. Um, let's hope we can have a bit of fun tonight and, and just keep going with it. So the usual housekeeping, uh, all webinars for this course will be held at 7.30. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time with recordings made for those of you who cannot attend on a given occasion. We still use Zoom for our webinars and thank goodness for the likes of them at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm talking to you from my home because uh, IT Masters for one have, have uh, been working off site all week. Um, but we use Zoom to encourage questions and the use of chat during the webinar. Um, we ask that you direct all questions relevant to course content to the Q&A section and that you send all administration type questions about dates and resource availability and quizzes and all that sort of stuff to the support team in chat. You can chat with panelists only or to all of your fellow students as well and you can make that choice by toggling through the drop down box once you open the chat log. I always recommend including everyone. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar and if a question is particularly relevant I'll interrupt dear Jeremy. I'm sure he'll not mind too much. Hannah is around tonight in an administrative and technical support role for IT Masters. She's also responsible for the, the course page, learn.itmasters.edu.au, which is where you'll find the other materials needed for this course. This week, I'll talk a bit about CSU or Charles Sturt University at, um, at the end of the webinar, just to give you an idea of what studying with us is about. Um, how the, and how we run our courses and how these short courses can help you in completing a postgraduate course. Um, I'm very sorry for those of you that have heard me say this so many times, but um, hopefully you'll get some new information. Anyway, uh, first and more importantly, please welcome Jeremy for more scintillating SISM talk. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this week's webinar. Thank you, Guy. That was great. Um, firstly, hello, Bruno. Um, you said hello in the chat session. I saw all that go by. Good evening. And uh, Akia Ora Darren. I hope I spoke, I uh, hope I pronounced it right. Is that right? Kia Ora? And Sounds good. That, yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. So this week we're going to talk about information security risk management. Um, it's an interesting topic because we're kind of living in a, in a period where uh, risk management kind of breaks down. Um, so, and, and not to be, um, you know, dramatic or anything like that, but often our risk management is all around the plausible risks and all around uh, trying to understand what is most likely to happen next and have the greatest impact. So likelihood and impact is going to be the theme uh, for this week. Um, they, um, but this, this event of COVID-19 is almost like a black swan event. I was talking to a friend of mine who uh, last year uh, booked some uh, holidays um, in Europe and is now unable to travel on that holiday. And he was kind of beating himself up about, oh, I've lost you know, money. I said, well, you actually, there was no way of predicting what has actually happened. It's kind of a, a once in a generation, even more event. And it, it's a black swan style event and we know there are black swans around but back in the old days black swan was believed to be a mythical creature so uh, it really is uh, there is a high risk um, but a very low probability of something like this happen and we often take those risks and shelve them kind of up the top because it's too difficult to actually deal with them but they do come around so it's a really interesting concept uh, to think about i hope everyone is staying safe uh washing their hands keeping their their distance um, and being sensible um, and making sure they don't uh, devoid every um, supermarket of toilet paper. That'd be great. And, you know, help the, help other people uh, manage their own risk. <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's dive in. Uh, I love this picture of a person looking into the waves um, and seeing the sign behind her saying sh uh, shark sighted today. Um, now this is a person who, hopefully walk past the sign and is assessing the risk, right? So 
this is what we're doing. We're in a organization, we have signs and we have um, information coming at us and we try to understand what risks are around. We try to understand if we hop in that water, if we go down that business path, what risks are going to be presented to us? How are we going to gauge that? How are we going to see into the future? Can we see what's happened around us? Can we see what's happening, um, you know, uh, get a better understanding of the risks so we can make a better decision? And it's really about achieving that, that balance between opportunities for gain in a business sense, like can we sell this product, can we put up this service, and minimising the likelihood of loss. Now, there are organisations that are quite keen and have a, a very good uh, risk appetite, good as in healthy, they like risk, they dive in and they run for it. There's other organisations which are risk averse, in, as in they will pad everything they do in extra process and procedure so that they can steer away from risk as much as possible. And we have to, as security um, professionals and information security managers, understand where our organisation sits. And it's really about getting to know the organisation so that we can fit uh, in correctly. Now, risks are identified um, and addressed uh, so that we don't have impact to the business in a negative manner, right? So there is gonna be some impact, maybe a little bit, but we wanna make sure that we're doing our best to address those risks that have that combination of likelihood and impact that put them up in the high zone. We talked a little bit, a bit about risk matrix or matrices last week, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that and how we actually rate risks but we're looking for those ones to address and work our way down the list. We want to make sure risks aren't wasted on unrealistic, sorry, we want to make sure that resources, our people, our time, our effort is not wasted, uh, addressing risks that are not plausible. Now it's difficult and, and this is something that information security managers and security professionals fall into occasionally is because they're looking at all these things that happen in the industry, all these metrics and all these attacks and all of these negative things that are happening, we can sometimes overstate risk. And we really need to try and see the risk from the business perspective, okay? That should be our main driver. What assets of the business could this risk impact? So that we don't dive in, cry wolf too many times and lose the trust of the business. So this risk management requires knowledge of, you know, obviously how your leadership operates and how they will react to certain news, uh, ability to absorb loss of the organization. So if there is a, um, you know, what sort of a, an incident would actually cause the, the organization to go under, the cost to implement controls to address the risk, and also the risk benefit ratio. So if you are going to implement a control, what benefit do you get out of reducing that risk? Is it worthwhile? If you spend a million dollars putting in IPS devices or virtual devices all around your data center, yet it's, the data center only has public information that you publish anyway, then maybe you're not spending the right amount of money on that risk. Okay, so that's a, a, a bit of a, some thought processes around risk management before we head dive into it. So what does the program look like? Well, we take uh, all of the, uh, the assets uh, and we look at all of the different threats and we'll go through this process and we prioritize our, our uh, activities. So we work from the highest risk down to the, the, uh, the lowest risk, the highest rated risk. Uh, and really, the best way to do that, there are lots of frameworks around and, and risk frameworks are uh, kind of uh, borrowed from other industries, um, you know, enterprise risk uh, from, you know, uh, project risk, um, corporate risk, financial risk. We too have information security risk and there are frameworks and structures that you can put in place to make sure that you're going through the right rigor and process. We want to make sure we do a periodic assessment. If you are assessing a system uh, in your organization, maybe you're ass assessing the HR system, you're looking at how people log in, how it's patched, all that sort of stuff. After a couple of years or even a year, 
it might have changed and may need a reassessment. But not only might it have changed um, in terms of degrading because systems just generally degrade over time due to patching and, and other reasons, but um, the, um, the industry might have changed, the threats might have changed, the landscape of who's trying to attack uh, that HR system might have changed as well. So we're, we're really wondering um, how we get that per uh, periodic assessment and then down to continuous improvement. And then we try and organize uh, the, uh, and align with the organizational strategy and get the culture right, make sure we're filtering the risks through the hierarchy correctly, the hierarchy of the organization, and we understand the risk appetite of the leadership of the business. And obviously the financial position as well. If you're in a, a security role, and there is zero upon zero year of budget, um, then it may be difficult to move ahead with the program. Um, being able to communicate that risk in such a way, not in a threatening way, but in a realistic way, say, look, if we spend this money here, we're gonna reduce the risk here and uh, have less chance of impacting the business, then this is the way to actually get budget through the risk management program. And we do that by doing a, a gap analysis against some kind of uh, standard. You might do it against 27001 or 27002 or against uh, some other um, uh, set of uh, criteria that you can measure your organization against. And then, of course, you prioritize the activities. All right. Now, I want to talk about threat scenarios. Threat scenarios are not described like this in the SISM, okay? So in the, the SISM uh, material, they talk about risk management and, and uh, uh, impact likelihood. We'll go through all of that, but this threat scenario is actually what I've learned over the years, how you actually communicate risk to the business. What I've seen over and over again from security guys like me coming from a technical background, we often overcomplicate our description of risk. We drag in terms, uh, technical terms, and we drag in our own understanding of the systems into statements to business users. And often you see their eyes glaze over. You see them kind of look away going, oh, I don't know what he's talking about, but they don't actually want to tell you, I don't know what you're talking about because they don't want to look kind of silly. Um, but you lose them uh, with the complex um, conversation. So the art of risk assessment is actually being able to describe threat scenarios in a way that a business user can understand. And there's a simple formula for this. We take three elements. We take the actor, the negative impact, impact and the asset, okay? So if there's anything you take away from these four courses around communicating risk and, and understanding how the business works, it's how to talk about threat scenarios and these three simple elements. The actor is a bad guy or a good guy because it can be unintentional. Um, we, they could be external or internal and you kind of, you get them, uh, you describe who the actor is. Then you talk about the negative impact, right? So exposure or, or destruction in terms of ransomware or, um, you know, or uh, loss of integrity because someone's messing with it. And then you talk about the asset. Is it confidential information? Is it a privileged function? or a business functionality, like the CRM software still working. And so we build this threat scenario out of these three elements. So I've got some examples here. So here's a vulnerability, right? So for convenience, staff are storing corporate credit cards on Pastebin. You know, for those who uh, aren't familiar with Pastebin, Pastebin is a public repository, like a public notepad that lots of information is thrown into, okay? So this is not a good place to store credit cards because there's no authentication for it. You just need to know the Pastebin uh, reference number and you're in. The threat scenario for such a vulnerability would be an external attacker, the actor, may gain unauthorized access, the negative impact, to the list of corporate credit card numbers, the asset. So we can see that we have the actor, the negative impact and the asset. Now this is a pretty simple threat scenario but if you can fit all of your risks into a threat scenario like this, when you are talking about the risk to the business and you actually include a real plausible actor, an actual negative impact that might happen, 
and an actual asset that they're concerned about, it is very powerful. It is the right way to talk to the business. And next one is, there's a big delete button right next to the update record button in the customer relationship manager application. Absolute crazy design, right? But this is just for an example. The, the, this is the vulnerability that can be exposed. The, the threat scenario is a staff member may accidentally delete the full customer database. We have a different actor, we have a different uh, negative impact, which is delete, and we have a different asset, the full customer database. You can see how putting it into these terms would make the, the business move. So, well, actually, you told me about something um, as, a, as the security manager, the business will say this, you told me about something that I really have to move on because I'm worried about my business. I'm worried about the thing that's important to me that actually puts food on my table at night and actually, you know, that's my livelihood. You've told me something now very clearly how it can be disrupted. It might not be as dramatic, uh, as, uh, dramatic as that, but that's the, the way we, um, we describe the risks. Okay, so in your risk registers, uh, I recommend when you're putting this together is you actually have a threat scenario column where you can describe out the threat scenarios. And you can usually get three or four threat scenarios out of a single vulnerability. And if you describe those, you can actually rate those threat scenarios in terms of likelihood and impact. And then uh, you can get an understanding of the risk. That's a good way to do it. Sorry, sorry, Jeremy. Uh, yes. Long-term short course attendee Anoop has asked whether this is what happened when Visa was hacked, uh, storing corporate credit cards on Payspin. Is that? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. I think it was a bit more sophisticated than that. Good. Um, that would be. Um, yeah, no, no, this is a very unlikely example. Um, Pastebin's not commonly used in corporate scenarios, more I in the, hope not. the hacker space. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. A good question. All right. So this is how it feels like sometimes when you're an uh, information security manager in a business and there is risk kind of swirling all around you and you're seeing these things that are going on and you want to move the leadership of the organization into action. You feel like someone shouting into a... Um, uh, into a microphone. Um, so what do we do about it? Well, we, we need to actually get people together. We create a couple of forums and committees, obviously do it over video conference now that we have um, you know, isolation in place uh, and social distancing. But what we're doing here is we're bringing people at different levels and telling them about risk at different levels, right? So there is a a, a forum for risks at a technical level. You might have frontline technical people who want to know about the vulnerability that affects PHP and, um, and Nginx specifically, right? So you've got this combination that's got a vulnerability in it um, and the versions are, and they wanna know about that and how they can fix it. And you talk at a very different level at those uh, to the technology people because you are getting really down into the, the technical details. Then you want to actually talk to the management level about the, the knowledge of the risk. So you would say something like, well, at this level, we're getting the managers together. We've actually got a, a critical vulnerability that allows an external attacker, starting to talk about actors, negative impact and asset, a, you know, we'll get uh, an, a, a, an external attacker will break into this website that holds our customer data. So you're starting to talk about that level. And then at the, the, the leadership level, you say, hey, we've got this problem going on. Can you give me the resources to go and fix it up? It's about a website and you give the threat scenario and they say, yes, let's get the resources going. Well, hopefully they say yes. So it's about disseminating that understanding of risk through different forums and committees. And you have to uh, get those forum committees going and have to have support from the, uh, the organization um, to be able to do that. And that's what a risk management framework is all about making sure the processes, the scheduled meetings are all in place so that you can disseminate uh, that information. All right, and it sits with the information security manager, the, the responsibility for risk management framework. Okay, some example risk management frameworks. Uh, this framework on the side looks a bit shoddy. These ones are a little bit more robust. There's 27001, obviously the information security management system is a risk management framework. You are doing continuous kind of assessment of your own uh, security program. Um, the 27005 is more specifically about information security risk management. 
and there's one specifically on risk management a bit higher level as well there's also sp 839 uh, which is kind of the granddaddy of all the risk management um, uh, frameworks and gives uh, good steps which we'll go through soon um, there's COVID 5 has got some risk management frameworks in it also have a look at rims the risk maturity model and frap which is the facilitated risk assessment processes now i talk about process, sorry. And I talk about these because these are actually in the CISM exam. These are the sorts of uh, questions they like to throw at you, which one of these are valid risk management frameworks. So get to know them if you're going for the exam. And thank you for 31,000, 20, 2019, John. Uh, okay, so, um, what are the components to our risk management framework? Well, obviously we've got a program scope. How wide does the risk management framework extend? Are we covering just one business unit or are we covering the entire organization? Are we covering subsidiaries? Um, you know, what is the, the scope of it? Uh, what are our objectives? Are we going to address all uh, critical and, and high um, uh, risks? Are we going to uh, address risks in a timely fashion? Are we going to uh, communicate risks to all levels? What is actually the objective of the framework? And what is the policy? Like who is responsible for what? How do people act when there's risk? Are people supposed to report risk when they see it? And who do they report it to? And what is their obligations as an employer, employee of the organization? Um, then, um, we talk about the risk appetite tolerance. We've already talked a little bit about this and trying to gauge what the organization uh, or how much um, um, resources the organization wants to put into addressing risk uh, and, and which risks will they address. Now this is, uh, we've talked a little bit about it, but this is actually quite difficult to do in practice. What I've noticed in leadership uh, forums and, and senior leadership uh, teams and executives is that they all have a different view of what constitutes a risk that they need to move on. And actually getting a consensus can be quite difficult sometimes. So actually having these forums and having this risk management process, part of that is getting that consensus, getting them talking about risk enough so they all start to level out and you get past the arguments. What I also notice is that there are some risks that some executives just will not tolerate. And even though they're not plausible or they're not the highest on your risk register, they will hammer that one risk all the time. I know I had one executive who just constantly talked about USB drives. And I think in the past role, he had lost data on a USB drive. Um, there were controls in place to, and it is tricky with USB drives, but he kept on talking about this one risk. So there are um, sort of scenarios like that where we have um, executives that will, will harp on a particular risk. So everyone's judgment of risk is a bit differently and, and understanding that appetite or tolerance is really important. And then understanding the roles and responsibilities in the framework, uh, who is scheduling meetings, who is meeting in the, you know, the executive or the, the steering committee, uh, who is sitting at the management level, who is at the frontline level and what are they supposed to do and how does the life cycle process work? So all these risks have, have, uh, have a life cycle, uh, you identify them, uh, you rate them, you address them, then you might have residual risk afterwards, depending on how your process goes. And that life cycle is supposed to continue, so you get that continuous improvement. And then obviously you need to document it all to make sure it all works, but also, uh, and stays consistent, but also so the auditors have something to look at when they come and ask you about it. And then obviously uh, getting support from management and then reviewing how you're going to do this risk management process is really important. So right on time, uh, VP. Um, the, the NIST features heavily in the CISM, so get to know it well. I think my first risk assessment uh, many years ago was based on SP 839. Uh, and it basically forms the basis for all kind of risk assessment um, and, and uh, has been, uh, I guess, on the, on the scene longer than others. Um, the, uh, so system characterization is all about understanding 
uh, the scope in which you are doing this particular risk assessment. Threat identification, you know, sorry, I'll just jump back to there. The scope of this particular risk assessment, it might be an application, it might be a platform, it might be an environment, it might be a data center, uh, it, you know, it might be uh, something very, uh, very specific or something very broad, hopefully um, uh, somewhere in the middle. So it's, it's sensible to be done. But usually when, you know, a practical way of doing this around an organization is, is picking off the top five applications that where revenue comes from or uh, sensitive data is held uh, in an organization and then going through a system characterization and scoping of, of what that risk assessment would be and doing those individually. So you have a different rating for those. Then understand the threat identification. So, you know, which actors uh, can actually damage the system or uh, modify, uh, sorry, or impact the confidentiality, integrity uh, and availability of the, the, um, the system or the system that we've characterized. What vulnerabilities might be there that would allow this threat to occur? Uh, do we have a, a lack of patching? And often um, uh, you would look at um, uh, a, a criteria uh, to assess it against. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, uh, you might, you could even do it against PCI DSS or 27002, which has got a, a complete list of how a, a information security should be applied uh, to a system and obviously those control requirements have to be um, considered in the uh, context of the system it's in right so you address each of the, you identify those risks individually um, and then uh, you analyze the controls that are currently in place to see if they uh, they actually address the vulnerabilities and then you dive into likelihood determination right so we've got these these risks uh, risks that may occur, how likely are they going to occur? You then do impact analysis. If they're this likely, how, uh, how much impact is going to occur? And then you start to determine where the risk is at. This likelihood and impact are the two key um, parts of risk assessment. Then we then talk about uh, control recommendations uh, where we say we've got you know, uh, an open firewall. Uh, it's allowing all ports into this particular server a control recommendation might be, oh, it only needs 80443, so let's close everything off uh, for 80443. That could be a recommendation. And then you document the results uh, and maybe give a, an overall risk score for that, um, for that assessment, okay? So a bit of a process to go through, but, but uh, this is the basic structure of doing a risk assessment. All right. This is great. I love this picture of a boat. I'm a bit of a boat fan. I love being on the water and I can see all sorts of risk here with this boat. It's got a structural integrity problem. I can't see it really floating for very long. Well, it'll probably float for a while, but it won't hold water because it's made of wood. Um, but yeah, I love this picture. Um, it, it kind of makes me think of uh, how sometimes you see the organization after doing a risk assessment, right? So you're looking about gaps uh, against a criteria. Um, the criteria being a, a, a list of requirements. Um, maybe it's published good practices. Uh, you can also get um, uh, criteria and, and external for support for a gap analysis from security groups and how they do it, um, you know, in the industry and in ISACA and, and um, other uh, areas. And also um, security news. Um, uh, you know, I think that one of the best podcasts I've listened to over how many years I've been in security is Risky Biz. I encourage everyone if they've not listened to it, it's a good Australian podcast by Patrick Gray um, that really gives you a good understanding of the industry and gives you that high level view. And I think this is important because it allows you to see risks in a different way. Because they're talking about the big news and big items, you start to prioritise risks a with a bit more perspective. So it's important to get that understanding from the, uh, the industry. Uh, also published research, there's plenty of research going on in, in universities around the globe and, and other corporates. Um, so pull on all of that. I think one of the best ones is the DBIR, the Verizon's DBIR, the Data Breach Investigation Report. Year on year, this has been a fantastic resource for me to figure out what to do in security programs because it is, important to uh, they take they take uh, incident data from 
hundreds of organizations and they map what is happening to which industries. If there's no, you know, this publication is a free publication from Verizon. If there's any um, uh, report that you want to uh, read for deciding what risks the industry is posing to your organization, that's the one. And then um, obviously uh, security training is important. You're doing it now and also, um, you know, vulnerability alerting. So all those alerts that come out and notices that come out from vendors about the vulnerabilities in their, the advisories they send out, the vulnerabilities in their products, uh, you need to know uh, what's going on there as well. All right, this is the risk management life cycle. This is a great Osaka diagram, classic. So we've got a program scope, we do risk identification, we do risk analysis, we're thinking about you know, asset valuation and appetite and uh, risk, uh, sorry, and likelihood and impact. Then we do the risk treatment. We've got to get a plan of action. We go fix a few things. Then we assess the risk again. Then we go through the whole process again. Okay, so we're doing this life cycle, making sure we're circling back, looking at the new risks and, and keeping fresh around what's going on. So if the, the information security manager doesn't know the main information security risks that are posed to the organization, then no one does. The information security manager should really be viewing and receiving risks from all around the organization from different processes. If it's all working properly, properly like we discussed last week, you're getting it from change management, you're getting it from, from project delivery, you're getting it from incident response from the service desk, you're getting it from all these different areas and understanding of the risk and, and we need to be experts in this space. Yes, I agree, uh, Nick M. It is true uh, that if the scope is too, um, too narrow, you can miss a risk completely. That's why the scope has to be well-defined to include all of the assets and systems that should be in an organization, but that's a good point. All right, so asset identification and valuation. And valuation. Where is the treasure? Uh, who holds the assets and which systems have the assets that the organization holds dear? What types of assets are in there? We're looking for uh, personal, personally identifiable information. Obviously, um, privacy is very important, has always been important, and now there's legislation to make us truly realize it's important. There are privileged functions in the business. What I mean by this is that uh, you may have uh, a, uh, a web-facing application that has just got public, publicly available data, right? So it's your catalog. You want everyone to get to it. Okay, but that doesn't mean you don't need to secure that website. Just because it doesn't have confidential information, the privilege function to do with that website is the asset. The privilege function is, able, is, is actually being able to update that information and modify that information. That's the privilege function. So if someone, your competitor was able to change your catalog to put all your prices up by 50% so that no one came and bought anything, then they've abused that privilege function to, uh, to modify that asset, right? So think about privilege functions in the organization as well. Who has the privilege function to turn off all of the virtual machines in your organization? This is a privilege function, it's not often thought about, but they are not accessing confidential or sensitive information directly, but they can basically switch off the whole organization, uh, private cloud infrastructure or public cloud infrastructure, okay? And then we're looking for internal information, staff, um, uh, you know, uh, assets about, uh, you know, technical details, um, uh, maybe password repositories, things like that, very sensitive, trade secrets, secret recipes, payment data is a classic, um, always uh, highly sought after by the, the criminals, and financial records, um, because no one likes their financial records exposed. We then think about lost scenarios, you know, uh, complete destruction. This is something that is real these days, actual um, uh, locking up of uh, gobs of data and then having to pay a ransom and hopefully never be in the decision where you're arguing against management, say don't pay the ransom. We don't want to perpetrate this, but it's the only way out of the, I, I feel for that situation. Um, but thinking about lost scenarios, um, you know, uh, uh, loss or exposure, right? Um, there may be some value based on the business knowledge, those secret recipes, those, those um, knowledge bases that you've created in the organization, what happens if they're wiped away? 
and there is also this idea of intangible and ta tangible value where you might lose something it won't cost you a dollar straight away but it causes a problem in the organization from a strategic perspective and maybe a future perspective. So we have to think about that kind of value as well. Um, so how do we identify risk? Well, this guy's not identifying risk very well. He's sitting on the edge of a skyscraper. I hope he's wearing a harness under there and he's done his risk assessment. Are they yeah, pretty serious shoes too, but not really. Wow, that's wild. <laughs> Yeah, so not a great identification of risk for this guy. Uh, we want to think about viability and plausibility. So how viable is it to actually exploit a risk um, or to uh, have a risk um, um, realized on purpose by someone? So having a vulnerability that is exploited. Um, you know, is it reasonable to expect, you know, someone to, to, uh, to uh, make, uh, realize this risk and, is there um, some sort of control that we can, we can apply that will allow us to, to address that risk? So for this guy falling off the, off the edge of the building, our control would be a harness, um, obviously, to stop him or just get him off the side of the building. Um, how do you figure this stuff out? Well, you get experienced staff, you get it, people who have a good understanding of the organization and what really hurts the organization when, when th things go wrong. And then someone with security knowledge and hopefully, uh, you know, you have that in abundance in the team, those two things, organizational and security knowledge. It is no good doing security in organization. And I think a lot of people take this, um, uh, this approach is that, oh, I'm doing security, you're doing the business. I'll let you know when I've, you know, you've got to do something and you better listen to me or I'll escalate like anything else. We have to be sympathetic to the business. We have to understand the business and, and, and come alongside the business and, and get the, to understand that organization, to help them through it and, and to identify the risks for them. And also there's external vendors and consultants who can come in and do a risk assessments. Uh, that's often done anyway, just to get uh, every now and then a, a good idea. And sometimes auditors, certainly for government entities uh, occurs fairly regularly and financial entities. Sorry, Jeremy, just yeah. if we can go back to that lovely picture, yeah. <laughs> Stephen's, put in the chat, he's identified the risk, but he's accepted it. <laughs> it looks like he's accepted it. He's pretty chilled yeah. out. Like, and the, the, is that the case? He's, you know, he knows that he's a maniac, <laughs> but, but actually loves it. Um, yeah. You know, the fact that you love flying close to the sun, you know, yeah. might be, might be something that happens, I guess. So the asset here solely belongs to the person taking the risk, which is, you know, acceptable, but there are other people that will be impacted by this. Uh, the likelihood of people, you know, being traumatized when he actually lands on the ground is quite high. Uh, maybe he's got a family that he provides for, you know, maybe knowing he could be too young, but that they could also be impacted. So there is a whole asset kind of analysis you can do around this and impact around this guy just sitting on the, the edge here um, that goes beyond himself as well. So that's why I think police, try and pull people back from things like this because it's not just themselves that they're damaging. So, um, yeah, no, I think you can take that approach in the organization sometimes as well. Um, some businesses will say, well, no, I'll accept the risk. We say, Hey, it's not just your area of the business you'll be impacting. If we have an exposure here, it's actually brand and reputation as well. There's a bigger, broader image, but and yeah, just the I'll, right thing to do. Yeah. And just the right thing to do. That's right. Get away from the ledge. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. That's a, it's a good extension of, um, yeah, of that identification of risk. All right. Now, uh, threats. So, uh, this is clearly a door that's had a few, uh, beat ups, um, people trying to get into it. Um, we have different categories of threats, physical, you know, someone trying to get through a door like this logical, getting over a network into a system, uh, a loss of service. The denial of service is quite clear, not just network thrashing now, but also, um, ransomware, uh, technical failures. Uh, so, you know, just things going wrong in a data center, pulling down lots of servers and unauthorized activities is a real big problem. So, um, we, um, yeah, we try and think about threats in these categories. We have ex internal, external threats. So people, uh, who have insider knowledge and insider access, not doing the right things with their authorization and taking advantage of what they have access to. It's called insider threat. And then the external threats, those who are trying to get in, which would typically called 
unauthorized access. We also have advanced persistent threats, which for many years we thought was a bit of scaremongering and uh, conspiracy, th conspiracy theorists, but um, theories, but quite clearly that's not the case. We do actually have them. Um, they've been involved in quite a number of high profile um, uh, break-ins now. So uh, it is here and stays with us. Uh, in some cases, this can be a bit like the black swan event. You can do your best efforts in keeping someone out of an organization. Um, and get uh, lots of support from the business and still have a problem and still have something going on. You can't, there's sometimes things you can't control. So uh, we have to be aware of that as well. And obviously third parties are, can be a threat as well. You may, uh, I think Target Corp in, in America when they had their big payment data breach is the good example of this where they had the Fazio, I think it was their uh, aircon um, supplier uh, logged into the VPN um, they and got access to an application. They were, um, you know, they had their credentials divulged to a hacker who then followed them in and put uh, a whole lot of um, uh, malware on the POS terminals. And that's how they got everything with uh, memory scraping. So there are uh, third party risks as well. We have to vet our third parties and make sure they're doing the right thing. I love this picture. It, this is so, uh, so typical of information security and systems. Um, there's this boom gate and then people just driving around it. Um, I love how this control is in place because it's such a poorly designed control. Um, there's clearly a weakness in this, um, this control. The boom gate's not doing its thing. Um, only the people who are sensibly, you know, who are trying to do the right thing will do the right thing, but quite clearly this is not working. Um, Anyway, there are degrees of vulnerability in, in systems, okay? So we are looking for those that are, are going to cause a major issue. Uh, a lot of problems with, uh, you know, uh, vulnerability scanners and vulnerability management is we try and draw attention to the highest risk, but it ends up being just a sea of vulnerabilities and trying to work out what's going on. So finding a good way to do that is important. You want to identify these vulnerabilities before there's an exploitation. Uh, categorize them uh, and rate them um, and there's you know these are some examples you know obviously software bugs come along um, it's important to realize that software bugs don't develop I, I talked about uh, systems degrading over time and it's not because they specifically change over time from a software vulnerability perspective but it's because in in version 1.0 the vulnerabilities are there then they just haven't been discovered yet. So over time, the vulnerabilities get discovered and then they can be exploited. They get, uh, you know, socialized with other hackers and uh, they get um, automated and then script kiddies can take and make use of them. So over time, they get unknown and, and done. So it's, it appears like systems are degrading, but actually software bugs are just coming to light. We also have misconfiguration. I can think of having wrong permissions on a folder um, weak passwords are a classic example or exposed passwords now, um, which is probably more pertinent. Um, you know, ha going to have I been pwned and having a look at how many password dumps are out there makes you realize that, that uh, passwords are really a big problem. Uh, staff awareness is a weakness. If they get that phishing email and they click on that link, why did they do that and why didn't they report it? Is it a bit strange? Should they have been thinking about, should they have, uh, is that a weird email to receive or they just click happy? Um, and then there's, uh, you know, or, or clear text transmission, someone grabbing it off the wire or off uh, the airwaves through uh, wireless. So the risk analysis uh, goes, uh, this is a little bit of rehashing. Um, the system does this a little bit. It, it looks at things from a couple of different angles, um, but basically we want to analyze risks uh, by understanding where these risk sources are coming from and the exposure to the asset. Uh, there's bees ahead here. So if you walk in here, your asset is your body. It may, it, there is a risk that they will sting you. The negative consequence is if you are allergic, you might blow up like a balloon. Uh, the, risk, the likelihood of risk of you getting stung, you don't really know. Uh, I can see someone walking there in the, on the right hand side. You don't really know. Are, are these European wasps maybe? Uh, but anyway, the, the, um, 
uh, the, the likelihood and risk, uh, they're trying to tell you about the likelihood and risk with the warning ahead. Obviously, they've had a problem in the past, so it's a good idea to heed it. And that's kind of your analysis about what's going on here. We do risk analysis all the time in every day. We're doing it now and having to re um, kind of think how we interact with people, how we do hygiene, because we have to think about the risk of, of contracting uh, the virus. So we're doing this risk assessment all the time. What is the likelihood? What is the impact? What are the, you know, the high, uh, touch areas or the high traffic areas that a lot of people would have touched, you know, poles that on, on public transport or, or handrails going up and down stairs. When do we have to wash our hands? Where might there be a need to do that? We're doing risk assessment and a risk analysis all the time. What's the source of this information? Well, you've got to pull on your past experience. You've got to, you know, look at published standards, look at what the, the, um, uh, the, uh, at the, what the industry is doing. Uh, you've got to look at maybe doing experiments and, and otherwise known as just testing, you know, finding out, you know, throwing your, your uh, little brother out there into the, the swarm of bees to see how he copes and then figuring out if you want to do it yourself. And then maybe you might use consultants as well who, uh, who uh, have been through, hopefully been through a fair bit of this experience before. I like that. Use chili as a sanitizer. Nice. <laughs> All right. Risk likelihood. We've talked about this, um, but it's important to focus on it because this is the, the kind of the kernel of how risk works. If we don't get likelihood right um, in our organisation, we will lose the trust of the organisation. If you say that everything has a high likelihood, it's not the case. When you come out and talk about a very implausible risk as being the next big thing, it, it kind of shakes the foundation. So sometimes when I'm feeling quite uh, emotional about a risk that I've just discovered, you know, like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that was the case. We need to go fix that straight away. Um, I'd like to then go and talk to someone else about it and someone else about it and then start explaining it a bit, write it down and try and let it sit. Obviously, if the risk is that big, it's a clear and present danger and needs to be sorted out. You go sort it out but often you have the time to actually let it sit for a bit and understand it and let it settle and then rate it correctly. Volatility, uh, volatility uh, how uh, likely is it going to occur, right? So, so does, it, does the likelihood go up and down depending on even the time of day, right? So is the likelihood of someone breaking in uh, to the computer room more likely on a, uh, like, on a weekday or a weekend. So is there volatility in the, in the likelihood? Um, how much prior warning would you get before the risk would happen? So is there a high velocity? Often when we get these massive risks, so the SMB V3 risk that's going on at the moment um, is a, uh, the vulnerability that's out there and being patched. We actually have a little bit of time. We don't think it's weaponized at the moment. So you actually can spend the time patching your systems rather than pulling out all stops. Often when we're dealing with the vulnerability that's out there in the industry and an exploit comes along straight away, you've got to pull out all stops and patch everything because it's wormable and, could, and it's starting to be used. Much like when WannaCry was making its way around the globe, we really had to push the patch for the um, MS17010. Uh, proximity, uh, time between event and impact. So when the vulnerability came out and how long you've got there as well. Uh, motivation, uh, what is in it for the attacker? This is really important um, because being able to explain a threat scenario with motivation of the attacker, what they get out of it is, is very compelling as well. And then we have uh, visibility, how easy, uh, sorry, skill level of difficulty, skill level of difficulty to exploit. Um, if you remember Blue Keep, which is that RDP vulnerability. When we, and I, I'm sorry about using all these vulnerabilities as examples like Microsoft vulnerabilities, but they're really good uh, case studies for how we actually do uh, likelihood. Um, when we have Blue Keep, uh, it came out say it's, it's exploitable. There's proof of concept for blue screen, but no proof of concept for actual getting shell. Um, the level of difficulty uh, was hard and it took a long time for some very smart people to actually come out with uh, a good exploit, which is now available, but we could we could watch it. So the skill level was quite high at the start. Now the skill level is very low. 
And visible, how easy is, is a vulnerable system to identify? If you've got a vulnerable system in the back end of your data center, no one can actually see it or find it or get there, then maybe there is less risk around that than something that is internet accessible. All right, uh, risk impact. Um, this is a pretty severe impact, this house falling on a car. Uh, we can see that the impact has both totaled the house and the car, <laughs> obviously after some sort of cyclone or hurricane. Uh, yeah, it does look a bit like Wizard of Oz. Um, and uh, we, we think in business in terms of loss of money, possible criminal liability for, for uh, people in leadership, reputational damage to the organization, which is more severe in some industries than others, uh, breach of privacy, which we should always be considerate about. I think sometimes our corporate minds don't think about individuals as much as we should, and we should really think about um, privacy in terms of if it was your own information that was made public and how you would want it to be treated, right? So your own expectations of your own privacy should guide how you treat the privacy of other people's information. Uh, competitive edge, you might lose those plans for that new product. Uh, and obviously interruption to business is bad uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and then trying to figure out what the maximum tolerable outages are. So how long can you be at without your data center before the business stops completely and is irrecoverable? So those sorts of conversations are important to have. Ah, quant qualitative analysis, my favorite. I'm not, uh, so I've done quantitative analysis before in an organization. Um, I think qualitative analysis has always been more successful for me uh, from a practical sense, right? So actually rating them in terms of, uh, you know, a, a description of risk and a color has been more impactful than dollar signs. I think dollar signs or, or dollar figures give uh, room for argument. And I think there is less argument around qualitative analysis. So I would recommend for most organizations go qualitative analysis. I know that um, insurers and um, banks, uh, those in the finance industry do a lot more qualitative analysis because that's the industry they're in and they're actually doing risk analysis and all sorts of other levels in that degree as well. So this is a very simple one. If you want to find one that you feel more comfortable with, then do a Google search for risk assessment matrix and see what comes up and have a look through them. Um, I think this is the simplest you might do. Obviously the extreme risk, and you might color this. This one might be purple, red, orange, and yellow or, or green. Yeah, I see, highly unlikely is missing. I don't know. It all depends on how you describe it. Uh, getting too fancy with this uh, will get difficult, um, but you need enough granularity for the sorts of risks that you have and the level of risk assessment you do. All right, quantitative analysis is a few different ways of doing it. Uh, you get that financial figure, you get uh, annual loss expectancy, single loss expectancy and the annual rate of occurrence. And there's the magic simple calculation there. I don't think there is one SISM exam that won't ask you about this. So make sure you understand that. And also the Octave process of quantitative analysis as well. You don't have to dive into it. You just need to know what it is. Um, and that's um, yeah important for the, uh, the certification. All right, now risk treatment and ownership. So when we come up with a risk in an organization, we kind of want to figure out how we're going to fix it and who is going to own that risk. Now the system is all about the security managers not owning the risk. And that's true. The business really owns the risk. Um, but there is risk to the information security managers as well, but I'll talk to uh, talk a bit about that um, later. Um, so is the risk acceptable? So we go to the risk owner and say, hey, this is what the risk is. We want to treat it. Uh, do, you, do you want to treat it this way? And you're actually asking is it acceptable to you or do you want to actually address it? 
maybe further analysis is requ required and they say, well, I'm not really sure. Can you come back with me with some more information? Uh, and then if you rank the risks by severity, you might actually give them context as to which ones they do actually want to address and how bad it is compared to other risks. And that's often how people gauge uh, where their risk is at by seeing all the risks laid out in front of them. Risk can be, to treat, be treated in, in a couple of different ways. There's a couple of ways that are good, uh, some that are particularly bad. Avoiding risk isn't as bad as you think it is. Uh, it's not a great uh, option for the business, but basically if you've got a line of business that is generating an amount of risk, you say, hey, this is causing this sort of risk. Uh, it's possible it will be realized. Uh, and the business might say, hey, that's too much risk. We're just gonna pull the pin and they'll avoid the risk entirely, right? On that product line. Transfer of risk, what's a good name for transfer? I'm looking at the chat screen now. Does anyone wanna pitch in? How would you transfer risk? Yes, Amanda wins the golden egg in the fry pan. Um, the transfer of risk is often called insurance, so you're actually making it uh, the financial loss someone else's problem. But of course, it is very difficult to transfer all risk because you still have reputational risk. You still have loss of, you know, making a claim and, and the increase in, um, uh, in insurance costs in your premium uh, and those sorts of things. So transfer of risk is not as clear cut as it appears, um, but important to have anyway for those black swan events. Uh, mitigate. Uh, so obviously address the risk, uh, reduce it, or maybe accept to say, hey, that product line, we like the product line, we don't mind the risk, let's keep going. Ignoring it is probably the worst of all the options where you actually bring a risk up to the executives and they then say, we never heard what you said. <laughs> and they just ignore it. Or let's move on to the next order of business before that guy speaks. Uh, so you don't want that, you wanna be heard. Uh, ignoring risk is not good practice for an organization. How, and obviously, often, do, how often does it happen, Jeremy? Uh, ignoring risk, yeah, um, not so deliberately like that. But I think there's, I've been part of organisations that have been so chaotic that when you've brought a risk to attention, there's been no way to track it or no way to see it through to the end. So almost more by, um, you know, incompetence than you know uh, outright, um, you know, ignoring. Mm. It. That's mm. kind of the way it works. Uh, if you have a good risk structure and you've got a good risk management framework in place, very hard to ignore risk because it goes down on paper. The auditors come and look at it and say, hey, you saw this risk. What did you do about it? And yeah, so it's not, not it's very hard to ignore. But usually if there's no decent risk framework in place, there's an opportunity to ignore it. Thanks. There's inherent and residual risk as well. So um, with a particular project, there is risks in actually doing the project um, just because it's making a change. And that's the inherent risk. It's the inherent risk of change that you cannot escape, but you try and mitigate, right? So that's inherent risk. The reason why that's important is because if you are assessing a risk for a particular project and they drag in a whole lot of risk outside of their project, then you can all of a sudden be addressing all of the risk around that project rather than doing the project itself. So you have to think about what the inherent risk is. So we want to address that. Then we think about the residual risk. So what is the risk after we've addressed or, or, or implemented a mitigation? So we've got, you know, a, a we've got 50, um, uh, and again, the software vulnerabilities are quite easy. We've got 50 vulnerabilities in this software package. We apply a, a series of patches. We've dealt with 30 of it. The residual risk is 20. We've gone from a medium risk to a low residual risk. Okay, so that's the, the concepts there to be aware of. Um, we also have uh, controls and regulatory uh, in place. Um, Right, so uh, the controls uh, into three broad categories, administrative, technical, and physical. Administrative is, is basically policies and procedures uh, and, and asking people to do the right thing. Technical is putting in a technical um, uh, risk mitigation. So um, 
Um, you know, you're receiving a whole lot of spam into your organization. A technical mitigation would be to put an anti-spam product in front of your mail server or in front of uh, Office 365 as the case may be, and then uh, have that uh, actually filter and you're actually putting in a technical um, control. A physical control is what it sounds like, a lock and a door, um, motion detections, alarms, that sort of thing. Um, there's also a regulatory. So uh, what is the impact of the regulatory on the business? Do they have to move? Is it just another risk? Do we have to comply with everything? What are the fines on top of that? Um, how does the business perceive regulatory? Are they straight up and down and say, yes, we must abide by the regulation to the law or is there wiggle room? Um, it's a business decision, but obviously we need to make the risk aware of that. Um, always with regulatory, we want to ask the question, where is the pressure coming from? Who is applying the pressure to get this regulation in place in our organization? That will tell you how you move forward um, and who will be the sponsor of actually getting those risks addressed. Then uh, what compliance levels do we need? Uh, do we need to be PCI compliant? Do we have a plan for PCI compliance? Because clearly that's the most important first step is to understand uh, your compliance obligations and then have a plan to achieve what you want to achieve. And then um, obviously we want to implement controls and get the compliance levels to where um, the business wants them to be. The cost versus benefit. It's not always simply buying a security product that will address a risk. It's nice to say, right, well, uh, we have these documents coming into the organization that are infected. Let's buy, you know, uh, half a million dollars worth of FireEye kit uh, and, and get uh, all of that um, put through those, you know, I, and, and these are kind of, you know, uh, gateway devices to filter uh, malicious documents and malicious uh, content but there may be another way to do it. So you may be able to do it by just saying, hey, uh, in our current environment, why don't we just say, well, let's stop receiving executable files, right? So having an understanding of, of what the, the, the different options are and what the benefit might be to the organization is really important for uh, pushing a particular solution. When you put in a solution, it's not just the acquisition cost. You've got to deploy and integrate into your uh, organization You've then got to work out uh, how to pay your ongoing support and maintenance costs, um, testing to get it working properly, uh, having the skills to, to test it properly, then uh, making sure it is helping with the compliance that you originally put it in for, if you put it in for that purpose. Uh, also in convenience to users, there's this old, kind of old uh, seesaw effect between usability and security. I don't necessarily agree that it's that clear cut. I think we can get controls that are both usable and secure. And that is the, the goal of many uh, kind of security architects that are uh, designing solutions is to get that apex between usability and security. But often a change in the security controls may cause inconvenience to the users at first. Uh, also, you're worried about slowing the business. What is the cost of getting that done? Uh, and slowing down the business for that period of time, cost of training, and obviously the life cycle question about decommissioning disposal. So it's not just about buying kit and putting it in. We have to think about the entire life cycle of the solution to address this risk. And a way we find uh, risks in the organization also, um, I'm realizing we're, we're just about out, out of time. The way we find risk is also understanding what the baseline should be for the organization. Um, how should we be configuring systems and, uh, and behaving in the organization to keep it secure? And anything below that is a source of risk, right? Um, why might we change the security baseline? It may, uh, there may be a, a different asset value over time, maybe developments in the industry, uh, new threats are always coming up, or maybe you've taken acquisition or built a new business or maybe there's been exploitation of some issue in the public domain and in the industry that you need to be aware of uh, and, and change uh, the security baseline to, to uh, satisfy that. Just, uh, just on time, end, so. Jeremy, um, no rush. It's a free course. I'm just grateful for you sticking around. So yeah, yeah, no problems. <laughs> We're almost there. Uh, the information asset classification, um, 
is important to in an organization. People need to know how to look at a document, understand its contents and say, hey, this is confidential or no, this is highly sensitive. I should now not send this to too many people. You want that kind of thought process in their head. And if you've got an asset classification policy or an asset classification standard, then you can set those levels. How many levels you should have is up to the business. I often think four is good, public, internal, confidential, highly confidential. Um, I think that uh, it's important to get people thinking about this, but it's really difficult to get it all identified and labeled. Um, and, and often impractical. Um, but yeah, it's important. The thought process is probably the, the most important thing. Um, how will these things be handled as well? So if you've got highly confidential information where you want to handle it in a certain way, um, also not just think about handle, but is the organization actually creating this information, updating it, archiving it, and disposing of it? And how is all that happening? So we've got to think about the life cycle of the of the information. How long will it be retained or needs to be retained? Uh, security likes to get rid of as much information as possible so that we can reduce the asset, so then reduce the risk. But then there's business and, and, and uh, regulatory requirements often for keeping records for a certain amount of time. So we've got to find uh, where that uh, compromise is. Thinking about owner and custodian, who takes ownership, who owns the business risk, and who owns the controls to keep the information safe and who approves access. And it's important to keep it simple. I've seen information classification policies get right down into the detail, but the simpler you can keep it, the more it will be followed. And that's just, you know, there will be those out there who read every word of it and stick to it, but on the vast majority, people don't like reading policies or standards. They just wanna know how very quickly how they should be uh, treating the information. So a information classification standard that has 13 different levels is probably too many for it to be practical in an, in an, in an ordinary organization. There's this idea of operational risk. These are important. I'm going to brush through, through these fairly quickly. Uh, they're included in here because they're in the SISM. If you're going to do the SISM exam, I reckon you need to go and uh, know what these are. Uh, RPO, recovery point objective, is the data restoration. SDO is a service restoration time, okay? MTO is maximum tolerable outage, the time in, you can be in recovery mode. These are all metrics for how long services can be unavailable for and how long data can be unavailable for. And they should be set by the business. When the business, when you go to the business and say, hey, how long can you be without this data? They're setting the recovery point objective. And then what IT does or what information security does is make sure that those systems are designed in a way that can satisfy these requirements from the business. There are all these re recovery time objectives. Um, and then there's um, the allowable interruption window as well, maximum service loss uh, for that time. So these are all good things to think about when you're doing uh, business impact analysis and business continuity planning. Now, finally, uh, or, or second last slide, I believe uh, a risk register is really important. You've got to keep diving into it, keep updating it, get an understanding of your vulnerabilities, the threat scenarios we talked about, the asset, the negative impact, and the, um, the actor, I said it in reverse, but you get my meaning. Uh, and then risk owners, date identified, who it was identified is handy too, date closed and the status. Or, or, so if it's not closed, obviously. And make sure you keep it simple. Um, I've seen risk registers that are enormous and take a lot of time to maintain, horizontally enormous. They could be vertically enormous, but keeping it simple in terms of the fields is important. My final thoughts on risk is to communicate risk at multiple levels. Make sure the organization knows about it through frontline management and senior leadership. That is the, the bit of the uh, quite a key objective. Make sure you're obtaining risk from multiple sources, from incidents, from, from projects, uh, from industry, from tools, technical tools. Um, build risk assessment into processes. So if you have a project delivery projects, build your risk assessment into that. If you have 
a change management process, build a risk assessment into that. If you have a development, a software development lifecycle, build risk processes into that. Um, every risk discussion you have with someone, every time you talk to someone about a threat scenario, it is an opportunity to educate them on the risks that are presented to them and an opportunity for them to be impacted by what you say and change their behavior. And if we think about it that way, we're not trying to sell it to them all the time, but we are providing sage advice and building that trust. And obviously document risk clearly. Those threat scenarios are some of the clearest ways you can document risk and get uh, traction uh, with the right people. And of course, again, keep it simple. We are prone to overcomplicating uh, the risks uh, uh, that are presented to us because uh, information security and cybersecurity is quite complex. What is going on in that picture? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is someone holding a laptop open. Um, sorry, the laptop is open and someone is um, doing a process that requires the enter button to be held down permanently. <laughs> Complexity kind of simplified, a, as the as the mouse pad says. Yes, this is not a simple way of doing things. So, uh, I guess uh, the the reason I put this in uh, is to uh, yeah, I guess keeping it simple and uh, being clear about um, about risk is important. Uh, don't overstretch and overcomplicate solutions. Yeah. Yeah, it's a stapler. It's been flattened out. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear yeah. okay all right so that's the end of this live session again we'll, um um uh, i i had a did you want me to um look at some of those or we do we want to take some questions yeah um, we'll jump to the yeah. questions uh, and we'll put these discussion questions in the, the module to or the webinar to forum um, they'll just be pinned chats. Um, yeah. After we go through the questions, I'll very briefly go through a couple of forum posts from the first module. Yep. Um, and and then uh, I'll, I'll very quickly go through the CSU oh, spiel, yeah. sure. uh, as is my responsibility. Uh, all right. So um, Luke's asked, is there a clear set of baselines for particular sectors? So would there be, you know, um, I guess, but I think we even talked about this last week, actually, best practices for particular sectors. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. I think um, even in sectors, uh, the similarities between organization um, uh, can be misleading. I think uh, rarely do you have cookie cutter approaches that can go from one to the other. I think how I generally work through this is I get a 2702, um kind of requirements list um and then you know a controls list and then i go through a gap analysis um and then come out with the risk assessment from that and then that starts the the kickoff on the baseline but i know kind of what you're trying to get at is can i shortcut all of that and unfortunately with a lot of this risk assessment there's just a hard grind to get through the analysis, uh, the, gap, the gap analysis and the uh, assessment of the risk to come out with, a, with an answer in the end. Um, I would say not to be too finicky about it. You go through all your gap analysis, uh, do it rather quickly first by, um, by um, interview. So going and talking to the people who know about different stuff, um, go and do it with interview. That's obviously imperfect because people answer things differently. Um, but then, or, or they don't know the full picture or, or might be very confident about something that's wrong. Um, but getting a, a risk analysis based on that the first time is a very good and quick way to, and, and fast way to get things done. And then uh, you can address some risk and get some stuff done. And then you can go through and do advice sampling and testing after that. So um, I think taking a pragmatic approach, um, there's no real way to shortcut it, I don't think, and do it really meaningfully. That's my answer. Thank you. Uh, anonymous attendee has uh, asked whether Hi, CISM covers um, various different um, other, other frameworks, 3LOD, COSO, ISO 31K, bow tie, et cetera. Um, and we, again, we discussed this last week, the way it yep. sort of, it, 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 it sort of umbrellas over a lot of things. Uh, yeah. And, and 
um, all of these different frameworks and standards are at your disposal to use them how, how you will. Yeah. So I think um, you use what you're comfortable with, you use what fits for your organization. And that's kind of the guidance I'd, I'd say there. Beauty. One from early in the webinar from Yusuf. Is the threat scenario the same as risk? Uh, it's different because uh, it's a, I would call it a story of risk, right? So you're actually telling a story with a very unhappy ending, <laughs> basically. Um, and it, and it kind of goes back to how humans use storytelling to convey concepts and principles and, and get, uh, you know, compelling ideas across. Um, so a, a risk is really a, um, uh, a, a concept of a bad thing that can happen. The threat scenario is the story about how that bad thing can happen and who would be involved. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, right. Well, I've just, I'm sorry. I've just missed the other ones. We're just running clear out of time. Um, so what I might do now is just very briefly go through um, a bit of a, a spiel about CSU. Yep, sure. um, so I'll steal the screen. Yeah, uh, and then if you can yeah, if you can talk me through it because I actually had terrible at presenting on GoToWebinar. Uh, um, am I in the slideshow at the moment? I can see you. Yep. Is that all? Is that all just slideshow? Yep. Beauty. Thank you. Uh, now I'll figure out whether I can actually go through the slides. Oh, there we go. All right. So this is just a very brief description of, of what studying with Charles Sturt University is all about. Um, we'll touch on a couple of subjects that Jeremy actually developed and delivers. Um, and I guess, yeah, if you have any questions, chuck them in and I'll, I'll try and answer them quickly at the end. Um, all right. So you can see all of our very beautiful campuses where Charles Sturt University, where IT Masters, who are a partner organization of Charles Sturt University, and you can see how lovely it looks in these regional centres throughout New South Wales and in Canberra and various other study centres around the place. Mm. The best thing about our courses is you don't have to go to these at all, um, <laughs> which is which is nice and particularly nice, I think, now, given you know there's a real risk of everyone being in lockdown very soon. Um, where online courses and, and CSU is actually, or Charles Sturt University, as I keep on forgetting to call it now, is actually quite good at distance ed. Um, a long history of it given it to a regional centre and this is the case when it, whether it's just by correspondence or online and of course everyone's scrambling to get online at the moment we're very good at things and you should definitely look at these slides <laughs> it's all a bit of a sales spiel so um, I guess the, first, the question for me is why the hell would you study at uni in the first place um, and, and for me I, I think that it's this is a this sort of industry IT and, and maybe even security particularly, you know, it's not something that, that intuitively seems like you need to study in university, but I don't know if you agree, Jeremy, but I think you get to a point where you, you've done all of the stuff, you've cut your teeth, you've got really good technical skills. And I, I so often speak to people who are like, all right, so then I want to progress my career. I want to, yeah. or, or for people that have been in a particular career and then have decided actually, no, I really love computers and I want to yeah. move from, I don't know, you know, sports therapist to to it these are the people i think that would really benefit from from getting the piece of paper to to get the foot in the door and for those already embedded in the industry it's for those that have got those positions sort of middle management or, or really started to to get to the point where they've, they've reached a bit of a ceiling to get to the next step it's about it's about getting through the first, getting over the first hurdle. And that is, you know, a piece of paper to get into the interview and then actually sell your wares. That's exactly how it happened for me, guys. So there was uh, one role I took, which was a step up role into another uh, organization from one organization. And I would say I'd been performing very much what the role required. So I had the experience, um, but a criteria was um, a, um, a high degree. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's so common. And, and honestly, like a lot of people here, you know, and we'll talk about credit later, have, have all of the skills necessary. It's just, it's just getting into the interview. Yeah. So, so part of my job is to, to make sure it's as easy as possible for you to do that. So we'll talk about that yeah. later, but yeah. Um, yeah. I guess the, the three reasons I can think of that are really clear as just as, as why you study in your changing career, progressing your career, and just because it's fun and it's interesting and it's something that, you know, you more than likely care about and, and have a bit of interest in and maybe hopefully you're passionate yeah. about. Um, and that passion is, you know, why else would you do anything else? Um, 
if you've got it. So entry requirements, um, you know, um, we, we try and get people in if we can. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, bachelor's degree or higher is the, the traditional one, but those with industry experience can come in through the graduate certificate pathway. Um, honestly, even if you haven't got professional experience, if you do a few of these short courses and you do well, because we have exams at the end of them, and you say, this is, this is my skill set and I'm desperate to incorporate these new things into it, we'd be mad to stop you. Um, you know, it's a, I, one of the things I say to the people I talk to out of these short courses or about it out of eligibility processes is, you know, I, I love seeing what I can get away with, um, with the university. If you want to do it, let's try it. Um, and there's heaps of different ways to do it. And, and honestly, if you, if you can, you can find the, the links yourself. We'll put all these slides up at the end of the, the show. We'll chuck it on the, on the course page. Um, for those that are inexperienced uh, or, or just, you know, maybe already have a different master's and are just looking for a foot in the door. The graduate certificate is often a really attractive option. It's four subjects. If you get a couple of credits or you've got, you know, one or two, one credit perhaps, then it's, it's not that onerous in terms of the time it'll take. You can get your foot in the door, you can consolidate and then you can chip away the rest of the masters or you can say, actually, I don't need the rest of the masters. Um, it's, 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 I've done my job of, of sort of getting the foot in the door. It's a, postgraduate award and, and often that'll get you over that first hurdle. Uh, for those that want to build, you know, I guess more skills or a, a, a more diverse set of skills or, or just really deep dive on one particular area. Um, for example, cybersecurity, you know, you can do the 12 subjects, but it's, it's, we try and keep it as flexible as possible, whatever works for you, whatever best satisfies your objectives. Again, it's, it's sort of like, you know, talking to the, the business objectives and then sort of doing your job according to what they are in the same way, you know, our job is to, to figure out what the hell you actually want and then, and then sort of tailor a solution for you. I put this slide in only because of this lovely picture of Jeremy on the bottom left. <laughs> uh, no, that's not me. I don't think. What? No, it's me, it's me on the right. No, no, kidding. No, I, <laughs> no. <laughs> is that not you? No, it's not me. That's me. Oh, it's certainly not my son. I, I stole this. I stole this from Martin Hale. I thought it was you, actually, Guy. No, God. <laughs> God, the, old, the old speed dealer glasses. Um, wow. I have yeah. no I stole this from a presentation of Martin Hale's. I, I've got all it's a hot, it's a dog of a, a presentation, and I've just pinched slides from everywhere. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll just go through right through that. Maybe just ignore the pictures. Yeah. yeah uh, no. The best thing about, I think, um, Charles Sturt Uni and IT Masters courses, and, and you know, don't assume knowledge because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's a really clear indication of why, um, yeah. is the, the, the split between what we call academic and industry subjects. Um, it's really important that, I think, uh, that you have a really good grounding in, in, you know, what theory is and, you know, talking about, I guess, the the really nitty gritty and getting granular on, on, you know, who thinks what and why and, and the, the various yeah. arguments, super interesting. It's why I go to university, but for people doing the IT masters courses, it's often about making sure that people are ready to apply the knowledge and apply the theory in an enterprise or government or, or job setting. Um, and that's why the subjects that we have, uh, particularly IT masters when we look after the industry side and CSU look after the academic side um, are often run and usually run by, by people that are embedded in the industry, the, you know, CISO at Macquarie or, or wherever they are. Um, we, we make sure that we get people that are actually doing the things that they're talking about so that we can maintain relevance to, to the people that we're trying to teach. And these are the subjects that we have as part of, Master of Cybersecurity, because I assume that's the one that most people are interested in. You'll see there, they're all tied to industry certifications. If people often ask, you know, what's more important? Should I get certification? Yeah. Should I get uh, a, a qualification? Yes. <laughs> the answer yeah. is maybe whatever yeah. works for you, whatever is best for your objectives, maybe both. Yeah. I particularly like the idea of, particularly for those people I was talking about earlier, who are changing careers of, of maybe doing a grad cert and then consolidating with a couple of industry certifications and getting credit later on. Um, a couple of these subjects um, are particularly relevant, I think, tonight. And um, we've got, oh, hello. We've got the, the CISM industry certification, and this is Jeremy's subject, cybersecurity management. He's actually yeah. teaching this in July. I think that's right, Jeremy. Yeah, looking forward to it. 
Yeah, it should be good. So that'll just expand on, on everything we've been talking about for the last two weeks and for the next yeah. two weeks after this. But it drags in written assessments and actually doing a big risk assessment against a gap analysis of fictitious companies. So it's, um, yeah, really interesting stuff. Yep. All the fun stuff. And, and again, yep. the, that sort of preparation for the actual application of the theory yes, yes, in the absolutely. workplace. You know, yep. it's just, um, and, and similar pen testing. It's, a, it's yeah. a subject that's based around you know, another industry certification and another sort of really important role if you're looking Yeah, at. so th this is exciting to me as well because we're doing, uh, I've been involved in a fair few capture the flag uh, and competitions for undergraduates at, a, at another university. And part of the, the um, you know, we have a couple of boxes to break into uh, for that pen testing course. So quite a lot of practical uh, stuff to do as well. Beauty. And as it says down the bottom here, you can either you know, do the masters to prepare for the certifications, or if you've already got that experience and, and often, you know, a lot of industry people have these certifications and, and just want the piece of paper at the end of it, you can get credit for the subject. There's no point making you learn something twice. I don't know. Yeah. There is a point listening to my voice for. Uh, oh, oh, well, that's certainly uh, true. And, and uh, Thursday night. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's the thing. If, if it's the third reason to, to do the masters, it's fun and it's interesting and you can engage with stuff that you really care about. <laughs> do all of the subjects, but if, if, if it's a sort of yeah. just a, the utility of the thing is to get you to the next step, you know, again, let's tailor yep. it to your objectives. Cool. Uh, there's some stuff on the qualification hierarchy. Uh, you can get a grad cert or a diploma before you do your masters. That's all fine. Time commitment. Um, I'm interested in your insights actually into this. Jeremy, was this, was this something that you, you found? Did you have to do 10 hours of study per week or were you already an expert and therefore were able to sort of, you know, maybe tailor um, your, your targets? Yeah, well, the, the good thing about um, the masters is you get quite a, a few disciplines, especially but from when I was doing it. Um, so, you know, you are doing some ethics as well and you are doing um, stuff that expands you, a lot of writing uh, more so than certifications do. So there is a fair bit of work in doing it. But again, there's no shortcut to getting this experience or getting this knowledge. But this is probably the most convenient way to do it. So 10 hours of study a week, it's, it's actually been 14 years since I did my... <laughs> my masters uh, in this same way um so uh, it's hard to remember i do remember doing a lot of work on the train uh, when i was going to the train, <laughs> the train in those days and i had a good 50 minutes on the train uh to work and i would do both ways and be kind of working on it all the time so i did a lot of work there so right there i almost did 10 hours a week so yeah i'm sure it was yeah Cool. And, and and the thing is, you know, we've got six sessions per year so we can get people in whenever is best for them when they think they can chip away at it. And, and the, the variable study load is important as well. You can do one subject if you or no, or you can get, take a leave of absence if you've got a big project on or if you've you just got a new kid or something like that. The important thing is to, to get on the front foot, to communicate clearly and, and sort of say, I need this. I want to do more. I want to do less. Um, and again, we're mad to get in people's way. Yeah. Uh, I like doing these things. This is credit assessments. Um, trying to figure out whether your industry certifications can get you credit towards a course of ours is a lot of fun because I get to learn about the certification for one thing and also learn about what you want and then start talking about, you know, what the dream job is and, and where you'd like to take your, your course and building the, the course plan towards it. We used to say we do not give credit for work experience and we still technically don't, but we recently found a way to piggyback off ACS's uh, accreditation program. So, help. Oh, right. so yeah. if you're an, an ACS member, you can go through this interview with them. It's like a half hour interview and you just tell war stories essentially. Um, so to say what your competencies are and who you've you know, delivered for, and then they, sort of put you on this scale called the Sophia scale and, and wherever you sit on that, you know, we can either award, you know, one or two credits. If you're setting strategy and, and sort of managing staff, you're more than likely going to get two credits. If you're doing good technical work, then you'll probably get one credit, um, you know, provided it fits within your course structure and, and with your objectives as well. I um, want to answer Dom's question in there, Guy. He said, yes, OCP be considered uh, for credit for the pen test. Um, at, most certainly would be. I don't do the assessment, but OSCP is considered the upper level of uh, pen 
you know, uh, pen test certification. So yes. It's on my list of things to actually assess, Jeremy. It's, it's mm. something that's not on our precedent list, but I've seen it a lot more in the last sort of six months or so. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's something we've got to get to. I, I, a good sort of from, from my understanding, it's a lot of work. So yeah. um, that would... Uh, it's a very steep learning curve, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, would, it would... That would suggest to me that it'll be very much eligible for credit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you want to, if you if you're interested in that stuff, do an eligibility assessment. I'll get in touch. Um, we'll talk absolute nonsense and <laughs> and a little bit of serious stuff as well, uh, just like I do in these short courses, which I love so much. Um, and there's my details if you if you want them. Um, if not, I just you know thank you so much for these short courses um, for engaging with them and um, yeah, I just I just. I think they're great. Um, so I'll stop the share and I'll chuck the slides back up to you, Jeremy. Yeah, and I'll say sure. thank you, Hannah, for looking after the chat and the course page. And thank you everyone for hanging around for a little bit longer than we anticipated today. Um, we always go long though. I think it's the best thing to do. Um, and, <laughs> and, and thank you, Jeremy, as always for, you know, really interesting content and an excellent delivery. Sure. That's good.